Good space time, y'all, and welcome to a new episode of the Citizen Cosmos podcast. We are Serge and Anna, and we discover the interchain by talking with awesome people from various teams and communities. Today, we have prepared yet another interchain special episode, which will take you on a journey across four interviews with four different projects from the Ethereum ecosystem. These are Trading Strategy AI, Gnosis, Radical, and Gitcoin. All the materials for this episode were recorded during the 2021 LISCON conference in Lisbon. Join us if you want to learn how dreams and ambitions turn to code and reality. Before we rock it off into our next episode, we would like to share the latest news of this episode's sponsor, Cyber. The Cyber Congress DAO has recently launched its bootloader network for the superintelligence Bostrom. The network is stable and the first IBC connection has been established. More news on the activation of Cyber's gift to follow soon. To test Cyber, head straight to their app on cyber.ai. So now I'm with Miko from Trading Strategy AI, researcher and analyst. Mirko, welcome to the show. It's my pleasure. I hope you all who are here have had a good conference and whoever is there listening to this, is uh, you can enjoy the YouTubes and all the other stuff going on uh, Crypto Twitter. Thank you. Let's start from Crypto Twitter because I know that it's your special part. You are the kind of Twitter trickster. Can I say that? <laughs> so tell me about why do you decided to do what you do in Twitter? So how you get to that stage that you believe that you should express yourself there, your tweets? It's very easy to say. I used to do blogging a long time ago. I have been also uh, writing uh, informative topics on Twitter, but no one really cares. The only thing they care is the shit posting, and that's how you get an engagement. So more you post shit, the more popular you are. Okay, and how to mix that um, shit contact with uh, what is your real values? Because I know that a lot of people come to you, start retweet, and you answer, and we can see that you have really deep understanding what is going on in the industry. So how that happened? It mainly happened just by uh, being around for a long time, being around for a decade, and seeing those uh, first crypto bubbles in 2013 and seeing the first altcoin booms with dots and all of that. It's not the same technology, but it's the same social events repeating over and over again. So it's, as somebody said, that uh, the fool who doesn't study history is going to repeat the mistakes of the past. And for me, but myself, I'm not going to apply for anybody anymore. So uh, I don't really any more care to speak truth and being harsh for people and hurt their feelings because that's what I have learned from the past and I hope the people don't repeat the same mistakes again. For me, I'm talking with a lot of founders and people who are in the blockchain industry and a lot of them say, okay, one day I decided that I want to work for myself. Could you tell me a little bit when it was that point then you decide, okay, I should stop to be an employee? That was even before blockchain. So I was studying back in Finland, 2001 to 2007. I was working for a big corporation. It was the largest mobile phone vendor by the time called Nokia. It was a, a really large enterprise with great people, great mats, great computers. It was super boring. And uh, even before blockchain in 2000, we had an active uh, scheme going on in an open source movement. Open source didn't exist really uh, until the Linux and uh, Firefox and all of these things came around. And I was a huge uh, open source advocate. And I was doing it as, as on my basically on spare time. And then uh, I got contacted by uh, people randomly from London. It was London School of Management. They just contacted me, sent me an email. We have uh, some problems. Can you help us to fix it? And uh, we can pay you. It was really early. So this, we didn't have Upwork or anything like that by the time. And then I was like, somebody wants to pay for me to work on things I want to do on open source from London. One and a half month later, I just told my boss that, hey, I'm, I'm going to uh, become a freelancer and uh, see you. See you next time in the next troll. I love your story because it's the story when you decide to do something and you just jump into the uncertainty of what is going on in the world. It's really uh, impressed me. So talking about open source advocate, could you uh, share your values? Why you believe in open source and why it's so important for you to follow the values of open source community? It's hard for people for uh, understand today, but like back in the uh, 90s when I was still a kid and early 2000, it was a different world. So if you wanted to build a software, 
the first thing you had to uh, do was to break money to buy a compiler and buy an operating system and uh, just pay for the software. It would be a strange idea for people for today that you need to pay for your web browser just to go to the web. Enemy by the time was Microsoft. Microsoft presented everything that's not open source. And there's even like these emails from Bill Gates and uh, who's the other guy, Stephen Elops, leaking like how they want to kill the open source movement and what they can do about it. And it was truly like uh, the fight of the generation. Now we have other fight going on. That's the fight over the finance. So that's actually building on the top of the open source we have now because it couldn't have happened if Bitcoin wouldn't have the open source movement behind it and Bitcoin was open source in 2009, so they already had the solid foundation going on. And it's basically just the value promise is simple, making the world fair place that if you have merit, if you have skills, if you want to become a software developer, you should be able to do it regardless if your parents have money or not. That's true. Absolutely. I agree with the, the point that uh, you should have the equal opportunities uh, if your parents have money or not. Yeah, it's because of the modern world and how we can express ourselves through this world. And back into your Twitter, do you believe that promoting open source and values of blockchain and how we can use the technology in that field can change the way of people thinking about that? I would say no. It has been going only worse. Now, especially the crypto narrative is dominated by being greedy, how much money you make. After you have made some money, that's enough to live. I mean, who cares how much money you make? It, I think I was speaking with uh, one of the crypto VCs on uh, Tuesday. The real measurement of your success is that uh, how big impact you have, how many hearts you will touch and how many people you can help in your life. And uh, I think that's a little bit lost nowadays in uh, crypto Twitter and uh, everywhere else. I agree with you that uh, crypto Twitter moved to a little bit another thing, but I think it's organic process. We cannot just go there and say, oh, you do something wrong, Twitter. <laughs> let's see how it's going. And let's move to your product, no project trading strategy AI. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your project and what are you doing? Yeah. You can go to a trading AI website today and go to Discord, but we have not launched yet. And it's basically a builds on the same movement that we discussed before. So open source and making everything open. Also taking the DeFi forward. So we have now seen what's there. And it all comes from the history that we first invented cryptocurrencies with Bitcoin. Then we invented smart contracts. Then we created the tokens. So we have assets. Now we have uh, different exchanges. And uh, on the top of that, we have... Uh, funds and DAOs and the back office protocols like Enzoom and uh, Aragon that you can actually build a decentralized organization. And if you look this from the perspective of finance, what we actually have done, we have been just replacing parts of the organizations with software. So we replaced the currency with software, replaced the exchanges with software. And now we are in a point that if you are doing investing, if you are like, a, let's say, professional trader or investor, the only uh, human left anymore is the investment manager who decides what to buy, where to buy, how much and when. And trading strategy AI. So our goal is to replace the last human with the program. So we have only a machine left trading there and there's no humans anymore. And other way, how to put it? So uh, other people are disintermediating banks. We are disintermediating PayPal, credit cards. So uh, we are disintermediating hedge funds, so we are here to kill all the hedge funds, and I believe that hedge funds are the evilest organization in the world, so we are doing good. Her ambitions to replace the last human in the chain. <laughs> Tell me, please, how you get to that point and you decide, okay, we have lack of this technology for the moment, when you start feeling that we need to replace the last human in the chain. Again, it comes back to the question that DeFi is moving a higher in the value hierarchy because after we have replaced money and making it fairer and uh, in the end, there's the last bastion is the, the old greedy guys who, if you have watched the movie of Wolf of the Wall Street and all of that stuff, so uh, looking like, hey, what those guys are doing, they are rich. Hmm, can we be rich as well? Can we make this more fair? How can we do it? So we basically need to uh, remove the fund managers and the greed element from there and make it open for everybody, that everybody could play with the same rules and have the equal chance to uh, enter this interesting game of finance. You mentioned Wolf from Wall Street. It's quite strong personality, it's quite strong person. 
So do you believe that the modern person who wanted to say his world in the finance industry should be looks like the main hero from Wolf from Wall Street or now it's uh, like a guy with the uh, small glasses wearing strange or super normal wearings and go to the conference using trams and metro and sitting at home most of the time trading through the laptop from the cafe maybe I would definitely say that I find the latter stereotype more appealing like here in the conference They tend to be more open and friendly than the Wall Street guys who I have been also talking with. But in the end, I believe that after you get wealth, after you get money, no matter how good is your heart, it will corrupt you. So that's why we need to replace the humans with machines because machines are uncorruptible. They don't do late payments. They don't change the fees. They are basically just being doing their task and they can't lie to you. That's the thing there. Yeah, I totally agree that machines cannot lie. I don't remember from Asimov, probably the first rule of robots, they cannot lie. I love uh, the theory that uh, we can implement only what we put into the robots. And do you believe that replacement of human can generate more equal uh, spreading of the interest from the capital? Because before, most of the interests are concentrated on the top of hedge funds and we can see that pyramids and why people get involved into the Wall Street big movement. Do you believe that if we replace human in the chain, it can help? It will definitely help. The real question is how much and how fast, especially if you are in uh, corrupted countries like Africa or uh, South America. I think the impact we can make is much higher because their uh, old finance system is more rotten. Here in uh, Western Europe, in USA, in places like South Korea, Japan, the system is more robust. There's institutions are more strong and they can't be gamed that much. So it's more difficult for uh, Western people to see what needs to be changed. But explaining these ideas to somebody who comes from a country where uh, the system is not that robust, they understand the problem better and they believe more to these kind of ideals. I agree with you. I hope it will happen sooner <laughs> than later. And last question, kind of traditional question for our podcast. Usually we ask people what motivates them and what kind of resources they can recommend. So for you, your best free tweeters and person who you want to recommend to read, to understand what is going on in uh, the blockchain industry, crypto industry, who you recommend to read in Twitter? I try to uh, follow some of these US lawyers. I think Gabriel Safiro is one of those that are like having, a, they understand the future, but they have a clear mindset and they have integrity. So it's not like these Tao frogs that think that we can do whatever we want and uh, it doesn't harm the society. So it's always try to uh, see the balance there, like if you are doing something and it's actually doing good or bad. Gabriel Safiro and uh, Stephen Pali, other lawyers. And then uh, my favorite, of course, on Twitter is uh, Rekt HQ, Rekt News. That's like uh, the only honest blockchain uh, <laughs> publication out there. So they don't have a vested interest with anybody and they are very, very brutal. Thank you very much for being with me today and thank you for coming. Thank you for yourself, Andy. It has been a pleasure. Now I'm with Gnosis teams. I'm with Lucas and Richards from Gnosis and they will say what they're doing now. Hey, nice to meet everyone. I'm Richard. I'm responsible for all the technical coordination at Gnosis. Safe. And we're currently looking into bringing more power to the ecosystem and letting them govern how we proceed with the safe and making it more like a safe, open system where everybody can participate. And I'm coordinating this on a technical level. And I'm Lucas. I'm originally a product guy, but recently I'm more also involved the same as Richard and kind of like this transition from building a product towards building an ecosystem. My involvement in the Gnosis Safe has changed from just product focus to more holistic, like how can we achieve this transition? What inspire you to do in Gnosis project right now? What is your inspiration? What is in your mind that you try to do right now? So for me, a lot of my inspiration is coming from the technical aspect. So I always enjoyed hacking and obviously having being fully in control of what you do 
is very amazing. So in the past, when I started, obviously, most of the developers started out with, you have to use Google, you have to use Amazon to host your software. And using blockchain where you have a decentralized piece and that can be accessed by everyone is very amazing. And it's, for me personally, a very big driver. And therefore, also, this transition for the safe, obviously, in the beginning, it was just, hey, yes, it's a way how I can manage my own crypto. But now pushing it towards more to an ecosystem project or to a bigger ecosystem where everybody can participate which drives forward full decentralization, becoming a standard, is something that really motivating me because I really believe in this decentralization that everybody, that you don't have to rely on one service and then suddenly a company like Facebook has issues and then for seven hours nobody can communicate with any of their friends. So it's having this fully decentralized infrastructure also is something that really motivates me. Do you believe that decentralization of such big projects like Facebook is something in our nearest future or we still far away from it. I think it depends a lot how you define decentralization, right? Like decentralization can mean many things. If we go something like full decentralization like Ethereum where you have a peer-to-peer -peer network, everybody can randomly join and leave. I think this is quite far away for some infrastructure parts, but you can also define decentralization already as something where you don't have to rely on a central instance. You can decide on your own, like, do I want to spin up the service, run it on my own machine, and the only reliant part right now maybe is your internet provider. I think decentralizing that one is going to be quite hard. But having in this form of decentralization, I think we are way closer to decentralize a lot of different parts in the community where people can spin up their own little piece of software, use it. And there are a lot of projects which make use of running more advanced logic, server kind of logic inside the browser with Wasm, which will allow empowering a lot of the users more directly. Maybe to add on that, uh, decentralization is not just like from a technical perspective something interesting. It's also the community involvement that, that's important. And even there, I think companies like Facebook and Twitter, I would like to see them involve their communities actually more in kind of setting the rules of the systems and like the, the ecosystem and so on. For example, Twitter is kind of defining what's kind of legitimate content that they want to have with their platform or not, but they're never asking kind of their community how this should be done. And just like these aspects of having the community more involved in like curating aspects or setting the rules of kind of how you can engage with platforms and ecosystem. That's something I think even kind of like the more traditional companies should go more towards in the near future. Yeah, I agree that you're saying about how we can define the centralization and it depends on the terms and what we mean by that. So in terms of that, do you think that the biggest question now is the balance between decentralization and efficiency? I think this will be the first thing that we have to tackle, yes. In the future, hopefully, we can use way more the technologies at a point where full decentralization is more feasible. But I mean, also for the safe, we already see that when it comes, mobile is a big part and mobile has a lot of constraints because there are devices that are not constantly full power connected to the network. They go to sleep, they normally have like wake up messages, they have low level services that have only full control. And this is very different to what your normal computer can do, how it can connect to the internet. And therefore, you have to differentiate how does a mobile device behave in the decentralized web and what does it mean for mobile to decentralize? How can you still bring the convenience of this mobile device to your decentralized users, right? And I think also there, it's a big part for us to figure out how to do this, work together with projects like Wallet Connect, who are also focusing a lot on this to make it possible for the whole ecosystem to, to also have the benefits of mobile and this convenience that mobile brings will also be one of the drivers to bring mass adoption to Web3 because it was super convenient to use Web 2.0. Therefore, a lot of people started using it. and Therefore, mobile is such a big driver. Cool. And what do you believe is the biggest driver for mass adoption of Web3? What it can be? Good question, because I think this what it is currently a driver to use Web3 is will be very different in the future. I think especially for us, we are based in Germany or in Lisbon, so we are based in Central Europe. Basically, it's quite hard to understand the motivation of a lot of people like who live in Venezuela and so on, where um, this Web3 brings them independence from their governance, where, because there's a loss of trust into the government. So I think this is a big part for a lot of parts in the world. For the Western world, I think um, another motivation is, is to some extent a lot simpler than the traditional finance system. You can do a lot of stuff that on a finance system requires a lot of bureaucratic work. You have to go to a lot of different entities. On a blockchain, you can do it with one transaction. I think the example that one of our founders, Martin, always brings, it's like, wouldn't it be nice if you can transfer your house to somebody else with just one transaction of an NFT transfer by? Currently in Germany, you would have to go to multiple instances 
pay a lot of money. I think also this is also what actually a lot of bigger companies like Facebook and a lot of banking institutes, what they find interesting in this decentralized technology where they can join this network and it's easier to fulfill certain transactions. And I think leveraging this will be a big driver also for mass adoption in the future. I love that you say leverage just can be a big driver because it's close to financial industry when the leverage is everything to get or big win or big lose. Do you believe that you can do something and you have to be very adjustable to a market to deliver that product market fit, to find product market fit right on time? Because if you are too early, it can be too early for the market. And if the ecosystem is not ready, you cannot find the product market fit. But if you're on time, it's good. But how to define this? That's actually quite interesting because we initially started building our project, the Gnosis Safe, as tool for individuals to manage the digital assets. But we were at this point just too early because at this point individuals, like the mass adoption wasn't there. We we're building something for when they would be there. So we kind of went two steps back and, and more optimized for the people that were already there, which were like crypto native projects and like uh, companies that are kind of were starting to build out the web free ecosystem. And only now, kind of like in the last six, 12 months, we're at the point where actually more retail users are coming into the Ethereum ecosystem and kind of start using applications such as NFT based applications. So participating in DAOs uh, where have the self-custody solutions for individuals that we initially built become more relevant. And so also kind of our uh, project will again go back to this initial idea we had on building awesome tooling for the masses or kind of like enabling these tools that are built by others. Cool. It's like a circle. If when you started off our first pearl, yeah, you go deeper and deeper. Maybe you will add something? I find Lucas' example very fitting. I think it's that we already were in this case, like we had this issue already as Lucas described and we went back to this mass adoption. And I think also this is why we believe in this ecosystem approach where it's like if you involve more people, you are more flexible because you have more people that can build on top of your product, allowing you transition potentially between different interfaces because a lot of times you have like a very common core and it's just a little bit the representation to the user is different. And by providing this flexibility, providing this openness so that everybody can participate Participate, we should be able to better facilitate or like better adjust to the changes also in the protocol. Like right now, it's very technical, but in the future, it might be necessary that you abstract away a lot of these technical details and that therefore you might want to have a separate interface based on the same technology. You can imagine it as an advanced mode and the simple mode, right? Like, and we discussed it in the past and it's just when you start a project, when you want to bring out your first version, it doesn't help to try to solve all the problems, right? You have to concentrate on one problem first. You cannot try to cover all the users, all the use cases. And so we will concentrate from our side on one, on this advanced user for now because it's an existing user, but make it possible so that others can plug in and adjust it so that they can then potentially target the users that are more specific to their target user groups or to new user groups coming up. So I have some tricky question then. You think that you should cover, of course it's reasonable, cover some small amount of user first. So do you believe that you should cover the necessities of that user that you understand better or how you prioritize the users? Because obviously you have a lot of segmentation and how you can find that users you should take care about first. I think I will hand it off to Lucas afterwards to also extend on what I'm saying since he's a product guy and I'm the technical guy. And I think in the past, also, we have to see a little bit where did the Gnosis safe come from? And it comes from the Gnosis Multisig, prior product from Gnosis. And then it's interesting, where did this product come from? It's actually like Gnosis built it for themselves because they wanted to manage their funds. So you have already the origin decides a little bit like also, okay, who do you listen for? Who do you build it for? And then we just saw, okay, we see who is using our product is like really the, the high rollers, the teams that have a lot of money. And therefore, it was the most straightforward to listen to them. Even so, I wouldn't say that they are the easiest to understand for us because if we look into the team, obviously, we are individual users, rather. And if we want ourselves to use the app, which is obviously also one of the goals, it's a little bit different use case there because we are more individuals than teams. So this is where why it's tricky, but we had more connections to the different teams and also to our own team, right? Like the, we were one of the first safe users ourselves, obviously. We moved a couple tens of million of dollars of funds into our safe as one of the first users. And therefore, it was easier to incorporate the feedback. But even now, it's always this, okay, 
how do we balance this uh, forward and external feedback with internal feedback? Because obviously also our team, uh, like our diagnosis team is coming to us and saying, hey, look, for us certain use cases are tricky to do. And we say, that's nice, but this is one specific use case. If we talk to the broader masses and if we try to collect feedback, we see a different picture on priorities, right? Maybe Lucas can also give more insight, but there's how to acquire this knowledge from our users. It's not always easy, but there are different ways. Yeah, it's especially tricky because oftentimes it's kind of a chicken neck problem where the use cases only emerge when there's kind of the tooling to enable them. So no one is using or trading NFTs if there's no way to securely store it or uh, exchange the NFTs with others. So it's hard to anticipate these use cases and kind of build the tooling that will enable these use cases. But it's more kind of like going in circles and like contributing the tools and then maybe some use cases emerge and then you can optimize for some of them. We definitely focused on, on like one specific user groups first, but we definitely see that there's a need kind of this ecosystem to build around because one company can never build out all use cases themselves, but rather we should find ways to have a set of projects focusing on different kinds of use cases. And, and Thank you, guys. And the kind of traditional questions, what inspired you in your daily life? It can be books, media, whatever, to do what you do on a daily basis, to move forward and do what you do every day. I think for a traditional question, I give a traditional answer. It's my family. Also for me, it's just this curiosity. I like to understand what is below the surface. So it's just like looking at this. It drives me because Ethereum and blockchain is such a vast universe where you can just you can go deeper and deeper. It's like a Alice in Wonderland where you just go deeper into the rabbit hole and you find something new every day and it's ever changing. And so this is something where it's like trying to understand this more completely is something that really motivates me for my work. Thank you. Actually, you are the first who say curiosity. <laughs> Thank you. And Lucas, you? I think it's also important that uh, we find some roots and kind of reality from time to time as we are in Web3 itself. We're engaging in kind of like the, these communities and kind of with same interests and uh, being in this filter bubble. And it's just important to sometimes see the, the challenges of like real human beings out there. And so for me, that's traveling, which inspires me, kind of seeing how different cultures are kind of living and kind of what, what their challenges are, are facing. And oftentimes they don't really need what we are building right now with Web3, but obviously there's quite some opportunity there to also provide better tooling for them to kind of engage in finance or to kind of have financial freedom and so on. And the other thing is maybe being in nature and just get detached completely from like kind of the troubles of day to day and just ground yourself. And that's what inspires me. So thank you guys for being with me today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Could you explain in a couple of words, what are you doing? I'm the head of community at Radical. Radical is a decentralized network for collaboration. Why do we need to decentralize collaboration? What is the idea behind it? Yeah, so we're all usually at this conference, an Ethereum conference, we're all building towards this thing called Web3, right? And so Web3, to me, represents a transition from an internet controlled by centralized platforms to an internet powered by decentralized protocols. So it's a space that's online, decentralized, and completely open source. Yet uh, hubs for collaboration, our code hosting platforms, our collaboration platforms, are still centralized and controlled by corporations. And so we believe that if we truly want to steward the Web3 vision, then we need to decentralize the root of our uh, domain, right? Which is like where we collaborate, where we build the software, and how we distribute the software. What is the biggest obstacles to decentralize the development collaboration. I think that there's a lot of entrenched social networks and behavior in our current centralized collaboration hubs, um, aka GitHub is one. And I also think that we're experimenting with a new type of development, DAO-driven development. So I think that the barriers come from trying to understand where we need to introduce decentralization and where we need to maintain centralized collaboration. So it's kind of like balancing efficiency versus decentralization. You don't want to flip everything on its head just to decentralize one aspect of your project. It's about progressively building decentralization into developer workflows and figuring out where to do that and when. And I think that that's kind of the biggest thing for Radical right now is that it's not reaching feature parity with collaboration platforms. It's kind of demonstrating what are the new ways that we can be experimenting with development and how can we be building tools for the people who are adopting those workflows now. Yeah, perfect. What is the milestones on the way? What can be a first milestone to understand, oh, okay, now we need to decentralize this part of our work? 
Yeah, I think it's all about what you're building, right? So I think that um, right now we have seen the rise of DAOs, decentralized organizations, who are coordinating around protocols that are governing uh, billions of dollars in value in DeFi to protocol ecosystems starting to distribute funds from their treasury to fund development ecosystems like Uniswap or Compound or Aave. And so I think that these projects that are experimenting with decentralized collaboration, meaning they're coordinating value via community governance, these types of projects can start thinking about where they need to decentralize their infrastructure. And it's not just because they want to or ideologically they want to because it aligns with their values. It's also because they need to because when you create a decentralized, when you are able to own your infrastructure and decentralize it, you're actually able to create a sovereign space for collaboration that is resilient to any, you could say, institutional rug pulls that they may come across, right? So it's actually something that we think that DAOs will need to do in the future as a means to maintain political, social, and financial resilience. And question just pop up in my head about uh, what happened if uh, we try to avoid the influence from biggest corporation, but sometimes in the DAO we can see that a lot of tokens concentrated in, with the several big players. Do you think it's a problem now or not? I wouldn't say per se it's a problem. I think it's a reality. And so I think that the centralization of token distributions among VCs, investors, team members is more something that should be called out and evaluated for what it is instead of immediately disregarded or ignored. Because I think that centralization exists, right? And I don't think that Web3 is means total decentralization. I think that it means creating spaces for evaluating authority surfaces of networks and understanding what the centralization points are and then creating more decentralized or and or community-driven processes around those centralization points to reduce the risk that that centralization brings to the network. You know what I mean? So it's about like understanding the points of decentralization and then creating processes processes around those points to minimize the risk and thus decentralizing authority, power, and also influence throughout the community. So I think it's like the conversation of like flat hierarchy versus hierarchy and that you can decentralize yourselves without committing to a completely fat, flat, total decentralization. I think it's kind of all about figuring out like what is the right puzzle of decentralization that fits within your project and making sure that you're just like constantly evaluating the risks that the centralization brings to your project or organization. Quite cool. And when you're speaking about the balance and how to balance the project itself, do you think that we need a lot of team members that share the same value to translate this value to the community or the community can develop their own values? I think that it always helps to have leaders who are able to steward a vision and values, and I think that's important for any project or any movement or anything. But I do think that the healthiest networks are ones that allow for the collective reevaluation of those values and give communities the space to opt into those values. So I think that the most successful protocol ecosystems have a sort of social contract in which since you are contributing to this project, you're contributing to a certain set of principles and value sets. That doesn't mean that you have to personally share them. It just means that you are responsible for kind of stewarding those visions with your work and with your contributions. And so I think it is important to have that social contract in place within a community. I think it's okay if, um, say, the founders or the original core team define that initial social contract, but I think it's up to the initial creators of that contract to create the space for the reevaluation of those values. And so it's all about like building the social infrastructure that allows a community to raise their voice and raise their issues and have those be fully considered instead of everybody kind of coming to consensus about every single decision. So do you think that if in the community we have a separate groups and they start to, let's not say just arguing, but uh, to not share all the values, you think it's helpful for communities and it's helpful for the community itself and for the project? Yeah, I think that we'll see that DAOs and decentralized organizations are actually like a patchwork of smaller, more modular sub-DAOs that represent uh, different groups of people with different values and different prime directives. And they all operate in, with each other um, within like a greater picture. So I think that it's less of like one DAO that's completely decentralized and more of 
one DAO coordinating the work and development of individual subgroups, working groups, work streams, whatever you want to call them, who are then operating within themselves and governing themselves. So I think it's more modular, this version of governance that uh, we'll see and succeed in kind of future protocol ecosystems. But thanks so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Now I have Kevin from Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Yep. <laughs> yep. I always try to pronounce it in the correct way, but I'm always confused. So, hey, Kevin. Hey, thanks so much for having me. In our podcast, we try to understand what motivates people to do what we do. So, your project now, I think it's five years old or something like this? Yep, Gitcoin was launched in 2017 and it's now 2021, so just over four years. Could you discover a little bit for us how you get the idea to start a such project? Totally. So Gitcoin is a place that you can get coins if you're a software engineer. And basically, I have been an engineering leader in the startup ecosystem out of Boulder, Colorado for about 10 or 15 years and have hired dozens of software engineers. And I just knew that the model for software recruitment was broken. And we built Gitcoin to be a better place for software engineers to break into working on open source software and getting technology jobs. So it was sort of born out of my experience doing engineering stuff for startups for the last 10 or 15 years. I love the part when you say that you wanted to attract the engineers for startups because we all know that it's a quite a competitive industry to yep. find a, such kind of engineer, especially for startups. So what do you think is the um, secret sauce for engineering to be attracting to a startup, not to a big corporation? I think that startups are a really great vehicle for creative construction and sometimes destruction. And they're all kind of like contained explosions. So routing people to the right projects, the projects that are doing good for the world and the projects that are going to be successful to me is a really important thing. So I think that it's really important that we move people from working on JP Morgan Chase or, or at like a FANG startup and have them working on open source and crypto. So that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, you mentioned open source, and we all know that the, most of the software now in the world is open source. Mm -hmm. Some people think that is an opposite, that it's yeah. quite interesting. So uh, when you discover that the open source is a um, value itself? Yeah, so there's a lot of software that's great that's proprietary, and there's also a lot of software that's amazing that's open source. Just so happens that most of our digital infrastructure is open source software. When I want to deploy a new startup, I don't write my own database server, I don't write my own web server, I just use open source software. And that's what runs a lot of the web out there. But it's kind of messed up because there's no business model for open source, it's just available for free online. And so because of that, the people who are maintaining this digital infrastructure are not properly compensated for the work that they do. So there's a large asymmetry between value created by open source and value captured by open source because there's no business model. And we think crypto can maybe help change that. So as I understand, you believe that crypto provides a good economic incentives to develop the open source? Yep, I think it provides a toolkit to build better incentives. And we're still experimenting with the best ways to fund public goods like open source software with crypto. What kind of other ways you can feel that is can be helpful to keep all the software open sourced? One of the things that's really great to me about open source software is that you can inspect it and that it's transparent and, and you know that it's doing what it says that it's doing. And so that's what's really exciting about open source to me. I do think that it's been a couple of ex interesting experiments in open source business models. Tokenization is obviously a thing. NFTs are obviously a thing. On Gitcoin grants, that's a way of raising money for your open source project and keeping the lights on while you build it out. Mirror is doing some really interesting stuff around funding open source software. And so there's a number of ways to experiment in funding open source with blockchain. And I don't know that we have the killer app yet, but there seems to be some interesting momentum. Cool. And uh, when uh, you personally discover blockchain for yourself? I uh, discovered Bitcoin in 2011, 2012 era, and I just kind of treated it as a toy for several years <laughs> until I realized that, oh my gosh, this thing really could change the world and got into it professionally. No, I do you remember any other tokens? Because that day I remember color tokens, yeah. not only Bitcoin. What is your maybe remarkable yeah. investment? Well, I'm, uh, my cocktail party anecdote is I was smart enough to buy, but not smart enough to hold. So I wouldn't <laughs> take investment advice to me. But I did mine some prime coin back in the day. I thought it was really cool to use proof of work for something useful like finding new prime numbers, but I got kicked off my DigitalOcean account from mining prime point, so uh, it didn't really work out. 
and now you're fully involved into your own project or you try to diversify by investing on being involved in other projects as a developer maybe? Well, I think that we just recently did a report on DAOs and we found that most people can't be meaningfully involved in more than two or three DAOs. And so a really common pattern we've seen is the 80-20 pattern where basically you're loosely involved in three or four DAOs and you've got one or two that you spend 80% of your time on. So that's what I've seen people be successful with entering the crypto space. Just know where you want to focus. Yeah, the focus and um, to be detected to one thing is kind of crucial for project success. Do you remember that in the point when you stop being like you and as a founder 100% of your project and think, oh, okay, maybe we need DAO or maybe it's yeah. a good way to do it? Gitcoin is all about funding open source software developers. And when we first launched, we were just focused on building a product in a community that people love. And that was where we focused. And I'm super proud of that. But now that we've got $6 million per quarter going through the platform, we've started to think a little bit about how we decentralize away from the central point of failure, which is me and the company and into a DAO. And I also think that we're building software for DAOs. So we've got to evolve forward and think like our customers, act like our customers. And that's the point in which we decided that we wanted to build a DAO, Gitcoin DAO. And where are you now for Gitcoin DAO? Yeah, so the Gitcoin DAO has hundreds of active members and they're in charge of governing Gitcoin, investigating and parsing the results of every Gitcoin grants round, which is kind of our flagship product. And then we're also launching different prototypes of coordination tools for the Ethereum community. So uh, we just launched NFT on stage called thegreatestlarp.com. And so just rapidly prototyping different softwares and launching them has been what we've been doing in the Gitcoin DAO. So far, so good, but it's only four months old. It's a baby DAO. <laughs> yeah, I love this term, like baby DAO. Speaking about something emerging, what kind of technologies or maybe projects that you can see now you feel that is quite promising in terms of development? The interesting thing for me is the combination of blockchain and AR and VR and artificial intelligence and just this whole idea of a metaverse, a intermediating a human experience that we all create peer to peer online, to me seems like a really exciting thing where a lot of possibilities for human potential can be unleashed. And so it's just that landscape, that emerging that I'm really excited about seeing. And I think it's going to take a decade or two, but I'm really excited to see what it looks like after that exists. Do you think that it's really need two decades? Because now we can see that technologies like speed up themselves. It's not like take decades as previously. Yeah, there is an accelerating growth curve, I think, that's happening in technology. It just depends on the technology. You know, they've been talking about nuclear fusion being 10 years away for the last 40 years. And <laughs> oh, is the metaverse going to be like that? Or is it going to be something that actually happens in the next 10 years? I'm inclined to say probably faster, but I always like to hedge my bets a little bit with making time predictions. Do you think that we need some shell points or some points to build the meta universe? I think just keep throwing spaghetti at the wall, seeing what works and doubling down on what works and throw away what doesn't work. Gitcoin was my seventh side project in crypto and I stuck with it because it clearly had legs. But I shut down all the projects that I threw spaghetti at the wall and didn't stick. And so it's that process of creation and navigating the idea maze that people have to get really comfortable with how tough that is. And it's really exciting when you find something that hits. And I can't tell you how much it's meant for me to be working on Bitcoin and to be help helping all these different people in the Ethereum community find their next career opportunity. So it's been really a lot of fun. But first, you got to do figure out where you can make an impact. And you can't do that without trying and experimenting. Talking about experimenting, you're not well known that is a not wide road. You, you have some side projects or pet projects that is good and others that is not so good. How can you see that your project is not so good and probably yeah. you need to kill the project because it's the totally. one of the most important point? Totally. Well, I think that basically startups are just this cycle of having a hypothesis and then launching an experiment and getting the results and then learning and then repeating with a new hypothesis that same loop or shutting it down. And so it's important to go into a launch with a hypothesis that you're testing. And for example, the thing that we just launched, thegreatestlarp.com is an NFT auction for funding public goods. And the hypothesis is that people will fund public goods if they get an NFT out of it. 
you know, after our interview, I'm going to go check the stats and the numbers will point me in one direction or not. So you've got to go into your experiment with a hypothesis, I think is the answer. And one point you can say that, oh, okay, your hypothesis wasn't correct yeah. and you need to kill the project. Kill it or learn from it and evolve it forward. I think that learning is one of the most important things with doing experiments and then evolving your strategy forward. That means you shut down the project, but maybe it means you take one glimmer of something that worked and you double down on that instead. Do you remember some features that uh, you did like this for your project? Yeah, totally. Gitcoin has been a series of experiments in funding open source software. We launched as a bounties product. We launched an ethical advertising platform for a couple of years. We built this thing called Gitcoin Quests, which was a way of onboarding people into Web3. And it turns out Gitcoin Grants is kind of our flagship. So now we're focused on Gitcoin Grants and Gitcoin Bounties. And so, but the product suite has been six or seven products over time of us launching experiments and then shutting them down when they didn't work. And it's that that learning that I'm most proud of. And what happened with Web3 project? Because I believe that Web3 is the biggest hype cycle term now in the crypto. We got it like, it was played by hundreds of people per day and people were earning NFTs for doing the quests and it was fun. But honestly, I think that people should go to Rabbit Hole GG when they're trying to get onboarded into the ecosystem. They hit product market fit way more than we did with quests just because we've been focused on Gitcoin grants. And so shout out to Brian Flynn, Brian Flynn and Rabbit Hole GG. I think that they're amazing. Yeah, I'm agree with that. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but we all know that your project, I think it was first in that direction. Is that yeah. correct? I'm not sure. There's always been different attempts at onboarding people. It was definitely a valiant attempt in that direction, but I'm not sure it was the first. Do you know Indiegogo or a project like this yeah. for a classic market? Do you believe that they have some disadvantages? Well, I think that if we do believe that software will be deployed by DAOs one day, then being a DAO-based entity would probably be an advantage in that world. But I don't know that Indiegogo and Etsy and all these other shops are going to be willing to transform their companies into DAOs just yet. So it might be a disadvantage for them. And the last kind of traditional question, could you say something? It can be some projects, it can be some ideas that inspired you to do what you do every day. Well, I think that one of the most inspiring projects out there for me has just been this long legacy of the history of the open source movement, with starting with Richard Stallman in the 1980s, basically saying, no, we need to have free software, software that does what I want as the user, not what the programmer at some company wants to do in order to extract, extract value from me. And then Linus Torvalds and Linux basically taking on Microsoft in the 90s for the cloud computing market and beating Microsoft. It's incredible. <laughs> and then I think that there's just this long history of people who have been fighting for using technology and cryptography to create a better world for average everyday citizens. And that's the most inspiring thing for me is to think that we could play a small part in carrying forward that mantle. Thank you, Kevin, for being with me today. Thanks so much for having me. Can't wait to check out the podcast. Thank you and bye to everyone.